Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third part of our Fostering Research Integrity Guest Speaker Series. My name is Sean Lacey. I'm the, the University's Research Integrity and Compliance Officer, and I'm delighted to have Dr. Mikhail DeBoer, epidemiologist working in the Department of Primary and Long-Term Care at the University Medical Centre Groningen in the Netherlands. He is chair of the Dutch Reproducibility Network and co-convener of the Groningen Reproducing Tea. Now, that's an interesting one there, so I'm interested to hear about what that, that actually means uh, later on. He has a broad interest in culture change within the science system with the aim of increasing the quality of research and education. So today, Mikhail will present on reproducibility, what's in it for us. Over to you, Mikhail. Sure, thank you, uh, Sean. Um, also, for having me here, um, I'll try to put up my um, slides. No problem. And start, apologies now for mumbling my words at the start of the introduction for you. <laughs> no problem. Let's see. Okay, is this visible for you uh, guys? It is indeed, yep. Okay. I'm try to, yeah. Okay, so, um, um, yeah, uh, reproducibility, uh, Sean. And, um, so, reproducibility are uh, sort of a journal clubs uh, that are um, organized in universities. They're they're sort of also um, started as a grassroots movement. Um, and we have in Groningen, we now have monthly meetings, usually with the. Uh, um, well, somebody who also speaks uh, and introduces a topic, and then we have a discussion on that. So it's it's quite similar to what we're doing today. Um, and as Sean said, I'm today I'm gonna talk a little bit about reproducibility, and um, hopefully uh, about what's in it for us a bit. Um, so the the attention for reproducibility and, and replication, and, and I'll go into those terms a bit more in a bit, um, started, I, I think, especially um, with this study. And this is a 2015 study in psychology. And what they did there is is that they, um, you, you might know it, but what they did is that, that um, um, they tried to redo a hundred impactful studies within the field of psychology um and so um and and these are these are the the results or the main results of that study and, and what you see on the x-axis are the original effect sizes so most of these effect sizes are sort of between 0 0.15 and, and 0 0.4 about and um um and and Almost all of these effect sizes were um, statistically significant. Um, well, and and then they redid these hundred studies and they calculated the effect sizes from these studies, and um, you see those on the y-axis. And and what is striking is that most of these effect sizes are lower than the original ones, and they actually spike around zero or maybe zero point zero five, so very very small. Or negligible uh, effects, and and, um, and many of them are also not statistically significant anymore. Um, now there's there's of course more ways than only looking at statistical significance, but um, sort of whatever way you choose the replication rate. So the rate in which the results were replicated was around fifty percent, and that well that that gave quite a shock. A, a shake to the um, in the field of psychology, but also in the in the broader field of research or science. And so, after this huge um, sort of multi-study replication attempt, um, there there were a couple of others in other fields, and and they um, more or less showed the same results. And and as a result of that, people started talking about. Uh, the replication crisis we are supposedly in, or maybe we are in. Uh, that's I'll, I'll leave that up to you. So um, <clears throat> this is, I think, where where a lot of the well, a lot of the increased attention of the of the 
uh, last years has has come from. Now, and and you might even say that partly because of this, and also partly because of uh, things you might have heard in the in the previous lectures, we're in a credibility crisis, and so people in society distrust science, um, and 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 that might be uh, partly because um, well we we as scientists can't even reproduce or replicate our results and and of course that's well for people in who are in um, and just citizens and and are are far away from science um, that's that's quite ununderstandable maybe okay so some definitions as I promised um, it's it's good to I think um, focus on the distinguish uh, or the, the distinction between um, the process of reproducibility versus the outcome of reproducibility. And I've, I've just talked about the outcome and replication rates. We'll come back to that in the next slide. Um, but the process is, is of course, very important. Uh, so the, the process of working reproducibly is, is means that, that you're transparent about and accountable for your research. So in, in principle, others should be able to reproduce the steps you've taken in your um, in your studies or in your research and um, yeah that sounds really logical it's it's I think at least that was the thing I was brought up when when I uh, did did my studies that that what you do um, should be reproducible for others and I think for a long time we've thought that we were doing, quite okay in that respect but actually now we realize that many of the things we do the way we write them up are actually not so reproducible at all for others and so the process of being reproducible or transparent um, I think there's a lot of things to win there still. and there's also a lot of work being done there now that's a prerequisite for having what we call um reproducible outcomes and then there's um, a couple of definitions that were put forward by uh, Brian Nozick and colleagues about that so they distinguish replication what we just talked about um, and so that's testing the reliability of prior findings with different data so actually redoing redoing entire studies collecting data and then um, analyzing those data to to see whether you can find the same results or similar results um, there's something that's called reproducibility which is a, a bit confusing because it's under the um, umbrella of reproducibility but whatever so reproducibility um, refers to testing the reliability of a prior finding using the same data and the same analysis strategy or code as it's sometimes referred to so it's actually having the data set of previous studies having their code or syntaxes or whatever, or being able to, um, well, reestablish those, and then doing the analysis. And of course, you would expect to find the same results then. But even then, sometimes we see that results are not the same. So something funny is going on. And there's a thing that's called uh, robustness. And robustness refers to testing the reliability of a prior finding using the same data. But a different analysis strategy and um, you, you might know there's there's been some um, well concern about um, researchers degrees of freedom within analysis strategies and and this this has to do with that and so if we make slightly or sometimes totally different choices in the way we analyze our data does that really matter for the results that we get and that that's robustness Okay, so um, over to you. I'm um, curious for the people who are in here. Maybe if you can um, join this poll, and hopefully it works, um, we can see whether you think that you work reproducibly, but you are, to what extent you do. So you can follow either the QR, QR, code, uh, QR code, sorry, or go to the, the website. But the code is probably the, the easiest.
I see we have one. Uh, uh, more things coming. We should be getting rock maybe around 11 or 12, maybe at least responses. Yep. Okay. So that, so that, um, it seems pretty varying. And so there's, and that's good, of course. Nobody thinks that it's really poor, but there's some people that think they're they they could really do better. And some uh, some think they're fair or or actually pretty good. Okay, let's see. Um, let's go over to another question while we're at it. And um, you've you've been talking about. Um, research integrity, of course, eh? which which is where these these or what the title of this module is. Um, so I'm interested in whether you think there's an overlap between research integrity and reproducibility, and then if so, what you think that overlap is. Maybe you can uh, also react to that. Reproducibility allows us to gouge the integrity of the research without reproducibility. Integrity is even irrelevant. Both are interconnected. Anything else? One should follow the other. Maybe in the discussion we can we can talk about which which one should follow the other, or um, if that's directional or not. Enables to build on research record. Reproducibility is a subset of research integrity. Okay. Okay, so um ah, work is reproducible it's visible if work is visible it's integrity also it's but not all studies are reproducible okay that's also something we might discuss during uh, or after the presentation okay so this is this is good to keep in our minds i think these um oh. remarks you made here um and and I think also nice to uh, to have a discussion about later on. Okay, so back to the replication uh, crisis or the so-called replication crisis. Um, now there's there's been people that that have thought about um, where these low replication rates or relatively low replication rates come from, and most work have um, or has been directed to uh, what, what we would call or what I would call precision so um, the combination of 
um, type 1 and type 2 errors. And so those are statistical errors and uh, things like publication bias and selective reporting. And so um, for those, for those uh, of you for whom that's a bit rusty, type 1 errors in statistics uh, refer to the probability um, <clears throat> of uh, accepting a null hypothesis when we shouldn't. And um, type two errors um, refer to um, the probability of making the error of, of um, not rejecting the uh, the, the uh, null hypothesis when in fact we should. Uh, so it has to do with whether things are statistically significant or not. And in type one error, um, we call them statistically significant, whereas the result isn't there. And in type two errors, it's the other way around. And uh, of course, if you look at replication in terms of statistical significance, those two play a major role. And what we also know is that statistically significant findings are more frequently published than um, non-significant uh, findings. So that gives publication bias, and, and uh, you might have also heard of selective reporting, and that's the phenomenon that people tend to, or researchers tend to, Report statistically significant findings, uh, as, as, um, for example, for some of their outcomes, uh, but not um, the ones, uh, so not the outcomes for which they have non significant findings. And so, um, and, and if that's the case, and you want to replicate those findings, then the chances of replicating um, such a finding are a priori lower than you would expect. Yeah, so that that's just has has to do with these statistical phenomena or precision related to. Now, not so much um, attention has been given given to to um, things that I would coin under the term uh, validity, and yeah, so validity of of studies, of the way you conduct studies, study methods. So if if you do a replication study, then you might have differences in the way you select, for instance, your participants. And I, in my field, in, in the field of medical science, we work with patients most often. And so the selection process of patients might just differ a little bit between the, the um, original study and the replication study, or the measurements might just be a little bit different, although you use the same measurement instrument, but maybe your, um, the, uh, your outcome assessor, um, well, not maybe, he is he or she will be different, and um, um, that might invoke different answers. And there might also be differences in confounding factors, uh, as we call in epidemiology. And so these sorts of things can also play a role, but there's not been too much focus on that. Um, and there's, I think, one other set of things that can... Um, cause differences uh, between results in original and replication studies, which uh, you can refer to as generalizability issues. And so is, is the domain of interest or the thing you estimate between these studies, is that really the same? And it cannot be assumed the same for the original and the replication study. And especially if your um, original study is, is well, outdated or is dated back uh, a couple of years, then there might be what you can uh, call uh, boundary conditions or uh, in epidemiology, we, can, we, we refer to those things as effect modifiers that have changed over time or that have a different meaning over time. And so maybe the severity or staging of the disease is, is different in my field, in the medical field, or the age of the patients is a bit different, but things like treatment modalities or, or frequencies can also change over time. Right? So um, in, in certain treatments for certain diseases, we see that the modalities are just different or the, the um, and, and that means that, that the effect could really be different. And then it's of course um, logical that your replication result will be different from your original result. And, and things like uh, changes in the healthcare system might also play a role. So these are these are all things that might really modify the treatment effect, and which make 
makes it logical that we never find 100% um, replication rates. Now, a little bit about um, what we can do to increase reproducibility throughout the research cycle. And, and I mean, you can formulate a research cycle in many different ways, but I've, I've done it like this. So it, it, you usually start with an ID uh, thing to study. And then usually, at least in my field, we need funding to actually execute a study. So we apply for funding. And in that process, or just a little bit after that, we uh, write a protocol. And that's where I think reproducibility really uh, kicks in. So I'm, I'm going to uh, um, skip that. But in the protocol phase, um, you can pre-register a protocol. And by pre-registering a protocol, you make sure that um, you make clear to everybody that, that what you plan is actually also what you deliver in the end, or you, you make clear where you deviate. And so you can pre-register, um, and you can do that as a standalone protocol, like in my field, uh, clinicaltrials.gov is, is a very well-known a portal for that, uh, but also the Cochrane Library. Um, you have things like As Predicted, and there's many other um, repositories where you can go with protocols or pre pre registrations. Um, and a different uh, place is the um, Open Science Framework, uh, where you can also um, <clears throat> submit a protocol, but that also enables you to put much more of your research um, products um, on there. So I'll, I'll come back to that in a bit. Another thing you can do is um, actually what we call is write a registered report. And um, that, that works as follows. Uh, this is, this is a, a journal in my field, but there's many now that accept registered reports. And for in registered reports, you write an introduction and a method section. You submit that. And when that's accepted, then in principle, um, your paper is also accepted when the results come in and you, and you write the results in a discussion section. So um, that also ensures that um, all the studies that we do and all the outcomes that we promise are actually published in the literature. So that, that's a way of um, sort of solving publication bias. A nice way. Now, in the execution phase, um, it's it's really important, I think, to mon monitor protocol deviations. So anything that, that you thought you were going to do, but um, you are not able to do sometimes in practice. And so you deviate from protocol or you have to make amendments. So you have to monitor these and, of course, write these down. And that's part of um, quality control. So that's that's important in this phase. And when you finish the study of course you have to check that again um write write it down and um and it, that goes for a lot of things but also uh, for instance uh, with with respect to the sample size you promised and maybe you weren't able to make now in the in the write-up um i think it's important to follow the reporting guidelines in my field there's a thing for uh, like consort for um, experimental studies and again, describe your protocol deviations. And then in, in the publication phase, there's um, well, things you can do with preprints. You might have heard of that. Um, but I think most importantly for reproducibility, um, it's, it's this. So you need to see whether you can at least share your code if you, if you have a statistical code. Um, if you can share your data, that's that's super. Um, but at least make it fair and so findable and, and uh, accessible, interoperable, and uh, reusable. And and that also goes for your procedures. So usually in the um, in the text of our papers, we only have a limited amount of space for our method section. But um, usually we need more space to describe our procedures in detail. So that's also something that I think we should do and make openly available. And again, the Open Science Framework is one of the platforms that you can use 
where you can deposit that that sort of information. Um, another thing, or another platform that's that's more recent is Octopus, which is also quite nice. You might have a look there as well. And then um, it's also very important to have your publication open access. So either uh, uh, preprint is also, of course, accessible to everybody, uh, but an open access publication as well. And so people can find what you've done even better. Okay, so I'm going to skip this. Maybe just a little bit about sharing data. I was I was quite uh, well <laughs> upset maybe when I read this paper. Um, so so this is on uh, sharing data, and um, these authors especially looked into um, uh, the the um, data avail availability statements of people, and especially um, into the um, uh, statement available upon reasonable request and and um, the reason i was shocked is is that that i actually um collaborate with a lot of researchers myself and and write uh, quite some papers and and we also quite often have this statement in our papers but these these authors um um researched this and what they did is they wrote all the um all the authors of these papers uh, where they had this statement, and they asked for their data. And this is um, what happened. So um, almost 1,800 manuscripts were eligible for contact contacting. And um, the first thing that is striking that more than 1,400 um, emails were not responded to. So they didn't hear anything back from those authors, even after repeated emails. So, yeah. There goes data sharing, and of the of the rest of the people who did respond, I think um, in the end uh, half of them um, shared their data. So that that means of the eighteen hundred um, papers, only they only received data from seven percent uh, upon their reasonable request. So that's I think really shocking. So if you have such a statement in your uh, papers, then um, it's it's really good to think whether you can really uh, or really want to share the data or um, or not. Okay. Oh, this is still on. Okay. So this is not so handy. Doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so to conclude, um, if you're thinking about maybe trying to work more reproducible, um, there's a couple of reasons you should should or uh, could do one of them is are, is related to the, the the stick so in your um, um, university there's a, a couple of policies in in which well um, it's stated that you're obliged to do certain things and so the, the policy on uh, research integrity data management and open access and um, many of those things come back in the code of good practice in research. So it's good to read them. Um, and this is what your university um, uh, thinks you're supposed to do or says that you're supposed to do. Um, but there's also carrots. And so if you want to read about the carrots, there's also selfish reasons to work reproducibly. And, and one of the things um, uh, that is, uh, I think, very important is to realize is that if you want to work more transparently or reproducibly, then that will take some time in the beginning, but that time will probably, or I think will actually uh, pay off um, in, in, the, in the longer run. Uh, because if you um, have sort of a good monitoring of your pro projects or you monitor them correctly and you have, if you have quantitative data, have a good code, and you can go back to that code to reanalyze your data whenever you need, then that really saves time. Uh, because usually we need to do those things, either in the process mm -hmm. of um, writing our uh, our papers, but or, or in response to reviewers, doing additional analysis and stuff like that. And um, uh, having sort of a, a transparent record of what you've done 
really, really helps in that. So it's not only that you're accountable and can be checked by others, but it's it helps yourself in your own work. And I think that's the that's the the best reason to to work reproducibly. And if you read this paper, there's also a, a mention of a couple of others. Okay, so I'm going to leave it at this. If you want to contact me or know more about the reproducibility network in the Netherlands, um, there's some contact details here. Um, I heard that there's also, um, they're starting up or they're trying to start up also a reproducibility network in Ireland. So I think that's good news for you. Um, so um, hopefully that that is um, well that's that will be established shortly and uh, then you have a point of contact in your own country as well. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing. That's it for me for now and hopefully we can have some uh, discussion or uh, questions. Perfect. Thanks very much for that Mikhail. Um, it was very interesting. Um, I definitely have a couple of questions, but I want to see, is there any, maybe, if so, so may, look, there's no questions in the chat yet. Um, maybe while I ask my questions and Mikhail is going maybe through some answers there, if you had some questions, it'd be great to see them posted in the chat. Equally, you could just unmute and ask uh, as well. There's no problem like that. And I suppose maybe to go back to the first poll, the interactive poll that you gave us, uh, where you asked, look, where do you see reproducibility and research integrity overlap? What about your answer? Now, even yeah, I, though I haven't said that, no, the poll was anonymous, so maybe I'm being unethical now, putting you on the spot here. No, no, no. Go, but, uh, just look, no. what would be your take on this? No, no problem. No, of course, this, this is good. Um, um, well, my take is that I think I see, um, I see overlap between them. Um, uh, so I, I don't think that that there, so that that uh, one of them includes the other totally so there there's distinct features but there's also overlap and i think the overlap is especially in um, um what what is defined as the, the questionable research practices so I, I i don't know if you've talked about that in, in one of the earlier uh, sessions yeah, yeah. so I, I think there there's a lot of overlap so many of these questionable research practices are um yeah uh, inherent in in irre ir irreproducible working but they also of course uh, reflect um well uh, n not so uh, much research integrity <laughs> yeah 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 so uh, our previous speaker as part of the series was dr mara heinle she would have spoken about the european code of research integrity and would have spoken about how unacceptable research practices questionable research practices where that overlap is so yeah that's actually it's interesting, yeah. So the reproducibility would kind of fall there. I suppose I, I would think uh, I'd be thinking similar to you. It's not that necessarily one is a subset of the other. I would think that they overlap. It's like two circles. Like if you think of a Venn diagram in the maths world, you know, yeah. you have your two circles that overlap a small bit. They are distinct, but they have overlapping themes as well. Yeah. Um, that's potentially that's kind of where I I, I would see it myself. I suppose. And then another question, maybe, and I'm not looking to hog all the time now here or anything like that, but. When you start mentioning, I suppose, the p-values and you start mentioning effect sizes, type one, type two errors and so off like that, like that's predominantly is related to quantitative research that we'd be looking at. So what's your take on the, this whole reproducibility for qualitative research? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah. So um, I think much of the work on uh, reproducibility has been done in, in sort of more the quantitative field. Eh? So uh, much has been done in, in uh, quantitative psychology and in the medical field. <clears throat> and things are evolving in, in um, uh, fields like uh, the humanities. And uh, But there's also a lot of discussion. Uh, and my, my own take is that, that um, well, uh, that actually for, and that goes for all disciplines that we should be more focused on what i call the um, um the process of uh, reproducibility so transparent working and not so much on the outcome um and and that if you focus on the outcome then then it will indefinitely be uh, or it will definitely be much harder to reproduce some stuff if you do qualitative research than when you do 
quantitative research. And in some cases, um, well, this is sort of inherent in the in the method, but also in in the perspective you have on research. Yeah, so for some, or maybe for a large part of qualitative research, it's it's not really uh, meant to replicate, or an, at, at least not exactly. But I think that that um, trying to reproduce, um, well, even results in qualitative research can um, help learn us a lot. Yeah, because that's interesting. It, actually, yeah, it's the sharing of the methods to getting the results can obviously be. I mean, that is a that can that is quite doable when it comes to qualitative research. You know, look, well, what methods was actually used here, and kind of outlining that. Uh, I have another question, kind of maybe, but there, but there has been one that's coming to the chat there, so I, maybe I'll ask that one first. Sure. So uh, a person in the chat there so said, I think you can publish work that turns out to be unreproducible, but integrity of the paper stands up to scrutiny. Integrity in such a case relies on an accurate description of the method and availability of the data, which can be scrutinized and inform the readership. And then I, I assume the next one feeds into that. But I think that last point kind of nearly just speaks a small bit to what was just, we were just saying there about the openness of the, the methods and the data that. So then a null hypothesis, we always want to reject it because we because who wants to publish a paper where the effect could not entirely be due to random chance? Ah, <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a nice one. Yeah. Um, let's see. I think you can publish. But let's go into the first one. I think you can publish yeah. work that turns out to be unreproducible, but the integrity of the paper stands up to scrutiny. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, I I totally agree. Yeah. I, so, as I I alluded to a bit, that there's many reasons, and sometimes also um, many uh, reasonable reasons why um, uh, results yeah do not uh, replicate. And I think, as I, as I just said, the, the most important thing is to learn from that. But that doesn't mean that um, um, the, the paper is bad, not at all, or the study was bad. No, so, so I, I totally agree that, that, you, that you can and, and actually should publish the paper. And that's, that's really, uh, it's really important. Yeah. The other thing is the null hypothesis. We all, always want to reject it. Because who wants to publish a paper where the effect could be entirely due to random chance? Well, that's that's not of always, of course, the, or of course that's not always the case if you reject an, uh, or if if you don't reject the null hypothesis. I mean, you can have very large and precise studies and still not uh, reject the null hypothesis, which, um, well, in a statistical uh, way of speaking, would mean that that you're quite sure that there's no effect. So, um, and and that might be or might i think it's really important to know always i think we should be able at least to retrieve results from all the studies we do somewhere whether it's in published form or at least in a repository or whatever but uh... perfect thanks very much Mikhail. um okay so another question then is i suppose when you go back to you the flow diagram there, you know, it was kind of like an S shape, and it's where you mentioned the pre-register reports, and you know, then yeah. the reports at the end, you know, that one. And I suppose I'm nearly being a devil's advocate here now. Then actually, something I personally believe in. Okay, but I suppose pre-registering your, uh, you know, your study now, you know, that's more work on us. I mean, you know, it's we already have a lot of work that we need to do, and we really just want to kind of get. And again, this is more speaking as a devil's advocate nowadays, guys, but. We really just want to just get on with the research. Let's just do the research, you know. Like, why, why go to all these other efforts? You know, I mean, doing everything, outlining the, the I suppose, the pre-registered um report initially, maybe looking at the report afterwards, and obviously on top of that, then we've ethics application forms. Mm -hmm. On top of that, then we've data management plans. Do you know, like, why, like, where does it stop? Yeah. No, yeah, that's a good question. Um, um, I think I think there's a couple of angles to this. So, <clears throat> one of is one of it is I think we have to, uh, in our minds, um, 
sort of make make a shift on how our research works. So now, um, I I think or up until now, for most people, much of the work is in um, the phase where we do the analyses and we write things up, and that costs us a lot of work. And then we have our product, namely a paper. Now, I I I think if you work reproducibly and you and you pre-register your study then actually much of the workload is shifted towards the the beginning of it the start of your project and so this is also something you have to sort of um well uh, it's a it's a mind shift um the other thing i think is is um that there is actually um or i hope there will be Reward in doing these things also because you can um, uh, make make it visible. So to all of these products that we make in between the start of our study and the final paper that we write, or I might write, um, we, we can put a, a DOI on that. So on a, on a protocol, we can put a DOI on that. On a data set, we can put a DOI on that, etc. So that means that we have to also think about research products not only in terms of papers or high impact papers but in these um yeah in a diversity of products that we deliver within a research project and um if you, if i i think i very shortly showed that octopus um um a website eh? Or at least I didn't show it, but I, I mentioned Octopus. And if you go to that website, that's that's a really nice example of um, how you can do that. And also um, by including different people for different products. So maybe um, you were mentioning the, da the data management plan, Sean. And that's, I mean, I agree, that's a lot of work. But there's, there's uh, people maybe also in your university, data stewards, that can help you with that. And they can be part of the people that write that data management plan and get credited for that, whereas they won't be on your paper or they won't be on your whatever. And so, um, and and in these platforms, you can cross links all these uh, products and which which I think um, gives a much better sense of, of the work we actually do in the different phases of our research and the credit that people should get for that. Now, um, having said that, I don't think our, sort of um, recognition system in the universities is is quite ready for that um, but I, I hope we're getting there I hope I hope we're getting there yeah look recognition is it that's topical you know when you think of Coara and that that was just something that wouldn't be mentioned in, in the email that when we were promoting this session just and how even Coara do call out reproducible and doing research that is reproducible is a form of quality. There's a line in Coara on that as well. Yeah. I suppose it's it, it's recognizing that if we're doing all these, like how do we get recognized for that? Um, the the question in the chat there, maybe I'll let you answer. I, I definitely have an answer to it, but maybe I'll let you answer it first. But uh, so a person says there, during my literature review, I came across two papers with different titles with same authors and same figures. They just changed. They just changed their story, but the results were the same. Is it ethical? Yeah, yeah. Short answer, no. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I mean, this is this. I, I mean, it's it's clear uh, to me. It's clearly unethical. But this this also again is tied up to the the recognition we get for writing papers now. And so people apparently think that they can sort of get away with this and then get the get the recognition for two papers because that is what they're rewarded for the, the number of papers and i i think we should take away that that carrot uh, <laughs> yeah like it was essentially like it, it's a no is that it, it this is actually a breach in integrity it's, yeah. it's actually when you look at our universities as an mtu's policy and research integrity uh if you look at the european code of conduct it, this, it, this is actually called out, this kind of scenario that's mentioned there. Also, maybe just for others in the room, we had a, I, I suppose what I'd be curious with is what journal was that, were those two papers in? Because were they, was it actually a predatory journal? 
because we had um, a very good uh, session two or three weeks ago on identifying predatory journals, which was laid out by our digital scholarship librarian, Sinead Hammerhan. And she would have actually used a very similar, an example like that of how two papers were within the same journal and uh, the title changed, but the author listing was the same and ultimately it was a predatory journal. And I suppose that that I that would be kind of a question that I have maybe for that one is what journals were they being published in as well? Because maybe they were predatory, which ultimately means there's no often there's no peer review in those as well. But I so there's probably a bit more to tease out with that. But essentially, is it ethical? No. There's definitely a publication ethics issue there. There's definitely a breach of integrity there, no doubt. Okay, we have another one, which is great. Uh I'll read it. I'm, I'm reading it out for the sake of the recording because I know that the chat doesn't appear in the recording. So, um, so bias and integrity. In determining risk of bias in papers selected for a systematic review, each of the ROB assessors identified the same papers for high risk of bias. In these cases, recruitment of particular participants was the issue. To be reproducible, the same profile of participants could be recruited elsewhere, but the same bias would remain or select more random participants, in which case probably not reproducible. Clearly reproducibility and objectivity slash honesty in selecting appropriate research methodology are re related to. Excellent, excellent yeah. question or observation. Now you're, you're totally right. So so yeah, studies can be uh, uh, what uh, biased, but still reproducible um, or uh, um, or irrepro ir irreproducible, but one of them might be actually quite good, um, and the other a bit less, probably then. But no, that's an excellent uh, observation. Yeah, sure. I think sometimes in some uh, seminars I've been, you know, you'd often hear somebody kind of saying a line is just because it's open doesn't necessarily mean it's good. Yeah. Okay, so. And I think that's maybe that kind of speaks to that comment a small bit. Now, the fact that it's opened allows us, if we wanted to, to inter interrogate the integrity of it, absolutely. But just because something is open doesn't mean it follows good research practice either. You know, and there could be a lot of limitations with it, uh, which I think is kind of speaks a small bit to that comment as well. But that's a, a very good uh, observation there. Yep. Thank you. Anything else for anyone? Some great uh, comments and questions there in the chat. Uh, thanks very much for that. Nothing else? Yeah, I see one extra. Check oh, yeah. out www.datastewards.ie. Perfect. So so check out that. Is, yeah, www.datastewards.ie, a new network called Sonry with the aim of recognizing researchers and training them in data management standards in Ireland. That's a G. Very good. I must check that out myself. Thanks very much for sharing that. Okay, I think we're okay there on time. For time, I think we're, that's good. Perfect. So look, thanks very much, uh, everyone, for, for the questions and that engagement. It always helps kind of these types uh, of seminars or webinars when there's that engagement. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Thank you, uh, Mikhail, for the work in preparing for the presentation and just being here for today. The, the topic of reproducibility is something that is very important. And um, it's it's new to a certain extent, and you know I think it's just great to have a, a speaker with your expert expertise coming here to speak to us on this. So thank you very much, uh, for the time for uh, today, Mikhail. It's my uh, my pleasure, uh, Sean. I really enjoyed it. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone.